Well, you could be seated, and good morning. It is just great to see people here. We had 114 people in the 9 o'clock service. Um, so this is just really terrific to be able to come back together, gather, worship. Um, it, is, uh, it is a huge blessing. And for those who are watching at home, we are delighted that you are with us as well. And uh, we look forward to the time when we can all be back together again in one service, and we hope that day is coming soon. Uh, this weekend is Memorial Day weekend, and we want to uh, pause and acknowledge that as a community of believers. I, I think um, even though the events of the last several weeks have you know, been explainable and you understand good motives and everything, we have, we've experienced a little bit of what it's like to lose freedoms. Um, and so it's good for us to pause at Memorial Day and say thank you for people who have given their lives uh, to defend the freedoms that we enjoy. Um, and I'd like you to do something. If you have a family member or a friend who gave their lives uh, in service of this country, would you stand? We had several in the first service. I don't know that we have, uh, we have as many this service. Okay. Uh, could you tell me the name of who the person is? I am so sorry, and we are so grateful. Um, what I would like to do is um, have us go before the Lord in prayer. And we are going to say thank you for, uh, his name is Don, Thomas Don. We're going to say thank you for him and for all the others that have given their lives for us. Uh, and we remember them. Let's pray. Father, um, we are reminded of the many ways that you bless us. And Lord, we stand behind a shield of people like Thomas Don who have given their lives that we can be here this morning. We recognize that the experiences of the last several weeks that we have had are the norm in many, many places in this world. And in fact, even the, the privileges that we enjoyed in the last several weeks of being able to worship together online are denied many people. And you have blessed us with people who will put themselves in danger that we would enjoy the blessings that we have. And we thank you for that. And Lord, we ask for comfort for those families who are grieving. Lord, we ask for comfort for uh, Thomas Don's family, friends, those who, who still carry the weight of grief of the a level of sacrifice that he made. And Lord, we thank you for that incredible blessing. There are many people that we don't know that today are gathering together to worship that are carrying heavy hearts because they remember friends, family that have sacrificed so much. We ask that you would comfort them. Lord, help us to not take for granted the many, many blessings that you give us, including the blessing that we celebrate this weekend, which is the blessing of the freedom and protection that we have in this country. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you um, have followed things online for FBC in the last 24 hours or so, you may know that I asked a question. Um, it's a very important question, life-changing question. The question is, um, where is it that you are likely to go and eat way too much? Um, I've loved the answers that we've received. Uh, we have heard about, um, oh, my favorite answers were the people who said, my kitchen. 
Um, let's see, uh, Tex-Mex was a popular answer. Um, Olive Garden showed up a few times. There was a restaurant in Henderson I've never been to called Sal's that I clearly need to go to and see if I can totally lose self-control. Um, the restaurant that I had in mind when I asked that question, for me, is a place called Texas or Tejas de Brazil, depending on where you live. I've only been there one time. And it wasn't because Ann and I had a bad experience. It was because Ann and I had an experience that was too good. So if you've never been there, let me just kind of explain how this place works. Everyone pays the same amount um, when, you, when you order, because you don't really order anything specific. So everyone kind of pays the same amount, and it's a very large amount, and that's one of the other reasons that we've only been there once. But once you pay this large amount, they kind of turn you loose to eat everything. There is a gigantic buffet. That is only a tiny sliver. That's like the smallest of suburbs of this buffet. It is huge. And if you're not careful, you can easily and foolishly just dive into this buffet because it's filled with salads and soups and all kinds of, of uh, desserts and things like that. It's just amazing. And you can just happily gorge yourself. But if you do, you've made a mistake. Because the buffet is not the star of the show. The star of the show are these little messengers from heaven. <laughs> and these messengers from heaven just kind of circle through the restaurant with giant skewers of meat and there are all kinds of meats and it doesn't matter what kind they happen to be carrying it's going to be amazing and they're just like happy little vultures that circle around and they come by your table and they just start slicing off meat and they leave it on your plate like little slices of heaven um, well Probably about three hours into the meal, um, I had this thought that it's like, you know, maybe, maybe I should stop. But then the braised beef ribs came by and that thought just kind of blew away. And by the time the Brazilian sausage came back around, that thought wasn't even a memory. And when the flame and yawn came back around for the first and only time in our marriage, Anne said, no, stop now, you are done. Fortunately for me, um, although my taste buds completely disagreed, my brain kind of kicked in and said, yeah, you really should stop, and if nothing else, you should stay out of trouble with your wife. And so I stopped but I didn't want to stop because inside of me, there is this struggle of this is so good. This is so appealing. I just want to just keep diving right in, even when I know that I shouldn't. And from what I saw online, there are several of you that know exactly what I'm talking about. And there are some of you who like me named Tejas de Brazil as their particular poison. Um, and I, that just made me feel good. Um, here's what's fascinating. That struggle between the brain and the taste buds, the brain and the stomach, that we can all relate to, is a very silly but real example of the internal struggle that Paul is going to talk about in today's passage. We're going to be in Romans chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 7 through 25. So I want to encourage you to turn there uh, if you have your Bible. And this is, I'll just warn you, this is a really challenging passage. Uh, there's a lot of theology in this passage. It's going to seem very confusing. He's going to use the same word and mean different things as he goes through the passage. And that's just going to kind of throw us off. But we are going to go slow. And we're going to pay attention to what is God saying to us through his word? And what I want to argue is theoretical and as theological as this is going to seem. 
It is incredibly relevant to us today. And the reason that it is relevant is because I believe what Paul deals with this, with, deals with in this passage is an answer to a question that every one of us is struggling with right now. And that question is, what is God up to in the midst of the craziness over the last few months? And I think we find a really important answer in this passage. Let me just do uh, a, a quick sort of review. I'm not going to do the normal review we've done for the book of Romans. I just want to remind you of what Paul has said about the law, because the law is going to be really central to this passage. In fact, Paul's overall point in this passage is that the law is good. But if you remember what Paul has said so far in the book of Romans is, is he has talked about the fact that the law, which he's talking about the law of Moses, you think about like the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament would be an example. But he's talked about the law as being really closely tied to sin and death. And in fact, we saw last week in the first part of Romans 7, Paul celebrates the fact that we are no longer condemned by the law. And if you're one of the original audiences, it would have raised a question for you. And that is, so are you saying that the law is bad? And Paul is going to address that question and say, absolutely not. And here's how he's going to do it. First, we're going to see the first part of the passage. He's going to show us that God's law is actually good. And he's going to make that declaration. And then he's going to do something that is a little bit of heart surgery for us. He is going to say the reason we think the law is bad is because of the corruption of our own hearts. And he's going to open that up and let us take a look. And in doing that, I think we see kind of what God is up to even in a moment like this. But he starts today uh, by showing us and by declaring that the law is good. It's a good rule to follow. So let's just read through the first part of the passage. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. It's a very strong negative. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetedness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but then, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Before we dive into this in detail, I want to make a quick point. I want you to notice that Paul continually talks in the past tense in this part of the passage. Because when we see the next part of the passage, Paul is going to shift to present tense. Why does that matter? You know, one of the huge confusions and debates about this passage is... Who's talking? Right? Is it Paul as a Christian? Is it Paul as a non-Christian? Is it Paul speaking on behalf of Israel? Is it Paul kind of speaking as if he is Adam? Those are your kind of major options. And what I'm going to suggest loosely is it in this first section, when he's in past tense, he's talking about what his experience was as a non-Christian. And when he shifts to present tense, he's talking about what his experience was as a Christian. And that we can all very much relate to. So let's look at what was Paul's experience. Well, the first thing we need to see is that Paul is saying, he's addressing in verse 7, what his point is in this section. Is the law bad? Is the law sin? And such a strong negative. No way. The law is not bad. In fact, he will say in verse 12 that the commandment or the law is holy and righteous and good. 
And in verse 7, he even says, this is why we know that the law is not bad, because, because it has a purpose. And we've actually seen this purpose before in chapter 5. If it had not been for the law, I would have not have known sin. In other words, law, and we saw this, like I said, in chapter 5, when the law comes, when Paul was made aware of, of what God's word said and what God's commandments were, it immediately made him aware that this is something that is displeasing to God. This is something that doesn't reflect God's character. And it made it known also, as we saw in chapter 5, what the penalty is for not obeying God's word and for not reflecting God's character. It's death, spiritual death, and, and uh, physical death. Then Paul uses an example to explain what he means. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said you shall not covet. You know what I find fascinating here? This is just a little freebie, a little aside. Um, of all the examples that Paul could have used, he uses something that is not less an external behavior than it is an attitude of the heart. And so often we get so focused on external behaviors, we forget that the attitude of the heart is a really big deal to God. Paul is saying, look, I, I wouldn't even known that coveting was, an, was a violation of God's character had God not revealed in his law that you shall not covet. And so he's saying, look, the law is good and the law has a purpose. It reveals God's character and reveals what it means to live out God's character. And as Paul goes on in this passage, he's going to explain why the law, which is holy and righteous and good, is so closely connected to sin and death. He says, but sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. See, the law isn't the problem. The problem is the corruption that was inside of Paul. Now, one of the things that's tricky is in verse 8, he uses the word sin in two different ways. The first way that he uses the word sin talks about that, that kind of moral corruption that is inside all of us. When Adam fell, when Adam sinned, everyone after him inherited this impulse, this, this corruption inside that moves us to choose what is against God's character. And so Paul is saying that part of him seized an opportunity, and what it did was produce sin, the behavior, and all of that came alive. But apart from the law, it was dead. Verse 9 is saying, I think that he once thought he was alive apart from the law, but when he saw the commandment, he realized that he was dead spiritually, and that the penalty for his sin was death. The commandment had promised life. How does a commandment promise life? It promises life because this is the way that we see God's character and we see God's character in action. But despite that, despite it saying, okay, this is what it looks like to actually live out God's character, what it produced in us was death and what it produced in Paul was death because of the realization he can never really live that out. And so sin that corrupting influence inside of us sees the coming of the law. It lied to Paul. It killed Paul. And it does the same thing for us. So I want us to stop and, and just reflect here for a second. What we get out of this first paragraph is that, is that God's commands are good. They reveal his character and show us how to live like his character. But the problem is, we don't like living under commands. Haven't all of us, at some point in the last few weeks, said to ourselves, I'm tired of people telling me where I can and can't go. I'm tired of people telling me what I can and can't wear. I am tired of walking into a grocery store and people telling me where I have to stand. 
I feel like a three-year-old. We struggle with authority. We've always struggled with the authority. We struggle with the authority of our parents. We struggle with the authority of our teachers, work, government. We struggle with church authority. And you know what? If we are honest, we struggle with God's authority in our lives. And I have seen this come to play in my own life over the past several weeks. You might remember that I was sick at the very beginning of this um, COVID season. I have no idea what to call this, the year of COVID. Um, And I was tested very early on. And um, one of the exciting things about that time was that, if you remember, tests were taking about 10 days to two weeks to get back. So get my test, and my doctor says to me, by regulations, you are now quarantined until we get the test results back. So I go home, and I'm not allowed to leave the house. I think, that's great. No problem. For the first three hours. <clears throat> and then I started realizing, I think I've gotten all I can out of this experience. Um, it's time for a new experience, like going to the grocery store. Surely, and this is how my mind starts doing. It's like, surely this isn't that big of a deal, right? I can just go to the grocery store. Or, okay, if I can't go to the grocery store, maybe I can go to the parking lot and just like walk around. Right? And I'm trying to find all these ways. And it's like, but you know what? What the Lord had to do was remind me of a passage that we're going to get to in a few weeks, Romans 13. Remind me that God's law, God's commandment is, is holy and righteous and good. And that includes when God says we need to obey and respect the authorities that God has put in place in our lives. So what? am I going to do if I believe that God's word, God's commands are holy, righteous, and good? I need to stay home. Let me give you another one that I suspect all of us have seen or felt over the last few weeks. Have you seen someone online, whether you knew them or not, be a little harsh, a little cruel, a little mean-spirited towards someone that you know and that you love? I have. Here's what wells up inside of me when I see that. There is an anger. There's an anger that's probably appropriate. But the problem is, that's not all that comes in the package. I'm not just angry. I am judgmental. And I'm self-righteous. And I like it. I like swimming in that self-righteousness because it makes me feel superior. I can look at that person who I may not even know. But I know now that I'm certainly better than that person. And what I need in those moments, what we all need in those moments, is to remember that God's law God's commands are holy, righteous, and good, including the command to love your neighbor as yourself. So here's my question for you. How have in the past few weeks, the past few months, how have you been confronted with that tendency inside of you that we say no one is going to tell me what to do? How has that extended even to your relationship with God. Where you've said, I know what God's word says. I know what is true. I know I'm supposed to be patient and forgive and respond with compassion. But let me give you all the reasons that I'm not going to in this case. Where have you convinced yourself that God's word doesn't apply to you in that situation? We tend to think of the law as a burden, or we tend to think of it as irrelevant in in a time where we are under God's grace. Here's what Paul says. It is holy, righteous, and good. And it's the corruption inside of us that makes a mess out of the law. 
And he's going to develop that thought in the next passage in verses 13 through 20, where he's going to talk about the problem is a bad influence inside of us that we too easily follow. Verses 13 and 14 say, did, did that which is good then bring death to me? That which is good would be the law. By no means, again, a really strong negative. It was sin in the sense of that corrupting influence. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. Paul is saying that the law is not the cause of death. Sin is, and again by sin, he's talking about that corrupting influence that's inside of us. And he's saying that sin, not the law, is what caused death. But notice also that there is a purpose that's in play. That sin might actually be revealed for what it is as sin. And, and this is important, that the law might show how bad sin is. And let me stop here real quick and tell you one of the things I get concerned about. In my life and in the life of, honestly, the church today, we get this backwards. We say, well, I'm under God's grace. So the law is bad and sin's not a big deal. Paul says, um, opposite, got it wrong. The law is a big deal. It matters that we reflect God's character. And sin is a big deal that we need to take seriously. It's interesting that he uses the word spiritual here to describe the law. The original meaning of this was that um, it is a gift from God. And Paul is saying that that's what the law is. It is a gift from God. But the reality is, even though I have this gift from God, Paul is saying, I still have this part of me that is heavily influenced by sin. And notice, he's now switching to present tense. This is his experience right now. The law is a gift, but there's a part of him that is corrupt, that is influenced by sin. And he keeps building on that thought. He says, for I do not understand my own actions. I can relate to that. Why did I say this to this person? Why did I do this? For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want. But I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. And Paul's point is, is that he is confused by what he does. And we can, again, we can relate. We do what we know is wrong, even when we don't want to do it. And that's what he's saying in verse 15. That's part of his experience. That's part of our experience. Verse 16 seems kind of weird, but what all he's saying here is, look, just by the fact that I know that what I'm doing is wrong and I don't want to do it, makes my point in my argument. The law is good. I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with that just by the very thing that I disagree with what I do. I'm agreeing that the law is good. And then he goes down to verse 17 and he makes a statement that he's going to repeat verbatim in verse 20. And the point of the statement here and the point of the statement there is that even though he agrees that the law is good, sin is such a powerful influence in his life that he gives in and does what, what he knows is wrong, almost as if he is completely out of control. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. Here again, he repeats verse 17. Now, if I do what I do not want, 
It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells with nothing good that dwells in him. Notice that he clarifies it. He's not talking about all of him. He's talking about that part of him that's still under the corrupting influence of sin. And he knows that that's true because of how he doesn't do and cannot do what he wants to. And he knows that that's true because he is constantly doing the evil that he does not want to do. And he just keeps doing it. And again, as in verse 17, the point here in verse 20 is that sin is so powerful in its influence, it's like it takes him over and he cannot resist. Well, the problem is, we just saw in chapter 6 that you can resist. So what in the world is Paul saying here? Is he contradicting himself? I don't think so. And I find this illustration to be incredibly helpful. I want you to think of life like this forest. Before you were a Christian, your life was totally dominated by this forest with the trees representing the corrupting power that we inherited from Adam, that the moral impulses that take us away from what is right and good and like God and everything in our lives were overrun by that corruption. But something happens when we come to Christ. The Holy Spirit starts making these clearings. And he starts moving out that corruption that affects other parts of our, that affects parts of our lives. Now, the fact is, that there's a huge part of our life that is still covered by forest. And there are lots of foresty things going on there. But over time, what you see is that these clearings start to get a little bit bigger. And more clearings start to appear. Start. Let me try to drive this point home very specifically. Here are some of the corrupting influences that every one of us has operating in our lives. These are the forest. Self-focus. Given to fear. Being in conflict. Being impatient. Cruelty towards people. Rebellion against what we know is right. Giving up on God or giving up on people, if God even factors into your life if, if you're not a Christian. Harshness, being out of control. We could list more, but those are just some that we know. I mean, we could, if we're honest, we look at our lives and say, yeah, I see those influences. I see those impulses that drive me to act out things that, that I know are not pleasing to God. These are the things that the Holy Spirit is working on to create a clearing and widen that clearing. But the great thing is, the Holy Spirit doesn't just clear it and leave it empty. The Holy Spirit puts something new there. And self-focus starts to become love. Fear gets replaced with joy. Conflict with peace. Impatience with patience. Cruelty with kindness. Rebellion with goodness giving up on God or people with faithfulness, harshness with gentleness, out of control with self-control. Of course, these are the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians 5. Do you want to know what God is doing right now in the midst of this craziness? Well, he's probably doing lots of things. But I can tell you, absolutely for certain, one of the things that he is doing in your life through all of this craziness is he is causing you to confront this in your life. And he is working to replace it with the fruit of the Spirit. So I encourage you to just take a second and look at the chart. Where have you seen the corrupting influences or impulses assert themselves over the last couple of months? Where have you seen self-focus or, or impatience or, or harshness? Where have you seen cruelty? Where have those things bubbled up in your life? How have you seen God work to replace them with the fruit of the Spirit in your life. 
if you want to know what God is doing, this is what he's doing in your life right now. By the way, it's what he'll be doing a month from now, and a year from now, and 20 years from now. Well, Paul ends this paragraph, this passage, by, by essentially summing everything up, kind of repeating the ideas he's had, but he adds something. He adds a very emotional element to it at the end. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. This is the principle that we have seen. He wants to do right, but evil is right there. I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. Verses 22 and 23, what Paul does is he names out, he, he identifies again for us what is the nature of the tension that we fell. And one of the reasons, or feel, one of the reasons that I think Paul is writing as a Christian is he says part of the tension is that he delights in the law of God and the deepest part of who he is. And that's not possible for a non-Christian. But at the same time, there's a war going on. And these words right here, waging war and captive, would have been words and images that that original audience would have known well. Because you see, here's what would happen. Rome would say, I think we're going to go wage war on someone. And they would. And they usually won. And what would happen to the losers? They come back to Rome as captives. So what Paul is saying here, see, is this law of, of sin is waging war against what he knows is right. But the fact is, he loses a lot. And when it says that it dwells in his members, it's saying this dwells in every part of who I am. And so in exasperation, in frustration, maybe even in anger, Paul cries out, wretched Man, this word wretched means miserable. I am miserable. Who will deliver me? Who will rescue me from this corruption that haunts me every single day? Let me stop there for a second. Is that going on inside of you? Have you seen that happen in your life? Where you, like Paul, cry out, I am miserable. Who will release me? As you looked at these corrupting influences, do you look at one of them and say, yes, there's one on that list where I struggle and I'm fighting right now and I'm crying out to God, I am miserable in this fight. Who will release me? I would suggest to you that if you can pick out something like that, whether it's on this list or not. That is where God is at work, widening, enlarging the clearings in your life. And that is a good place to focus. So the question is, what do you do about that? If you can identify one of those places, how do you respond? Well, the answer is in verse 25. And Paul actually says two things in this verse. The second thing he says is actually a summary in one sentence of this entire passage. And boy, couldn't have this sermon been shorter. But it's also a summary of, of just the, the anxiety, the, 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 the craving to be free. It's, I, I serve the law of God with part of me. But there's another part of me that's calling for my loyalty and my service. And that other part of me is the corrupting influence of sin that remains in my life. That's the second thing Paul does. But the first thing Paul does in this verse is to answer the question from verse 24. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And the answer is Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means this. 
first off. If you are a follower of Christ, if you have repented and believed in Jesus, that his death and resurrection is what will save you, and you've said, I want to follow him, then you are released from the control of sin in that way. Sin is still going to have an influence, but you do not have to give in. And this is also the promise that one day those clearings are going to be all over our life and will be the only thing that we see and that day is going to be the day that is in heaven. But how does that help us practically? How does that help us with the battle today? I have bad news for you. Paul answers that question in next week's passage. So you're going to have to come back next week. But this week's passage does not leave us abandoned. I think there are two things from today's passage that will really help us participate in the Holy Spirit's work of widening the clearings. The first one is this. Remember that you have a roadmap. Right? Paul has argued that's the whole point of this passage. That what God gives us in his word, in his commands, and in his law are, are holy and righteous and good. We're not under the condemning power of the law. We don't live in a performance system with God anymore. But God has revealed to us what he is like and what it is like for us to actually live out his character. That forest part of you, those corrupting influences that is a work inside of you are going to say things to you like, well, you know where God says turn the other cheek or Jesus says turn the other cheek? Not in this case. Because in this case, you would just be a doormat. And God doesn't want you to be a doormat. God wants you to take care of yourself. So you don't really need to turn the other cheek. In this case, this is an exception. Here's what you need to do in participating with the Holy Spirit's work of widening the clearances. Catch yourself when you make excuses for God's word or explain away why it doesn't apply in that situation. Catch yourself. We all do that. The second thing is to pay attention to the struggle that Paul has described in these verses. Now, if some part of you at some level isn't crying out, wretched man that I am, then that should be a warning to you. Something is wrong. If there is not a single part of you that is saying, wretched man that I am, it's quite possible it's because you have given in to the battle. You have given in to sin, and you are no longer battling. But if you are battling, don't be discouraged. The war is ongoing. It is going to be a part of your life. And what you need to do is keep going to the Holy Spirit and asking for wisdom and strength to obey. What does it look like in this case to turn the other cheek? I know that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm terrified. I am going to be treated like a doormat. But what does it look like for me to actually do that? We are no longer under performance system with God. That was last week's passage. If you're a follower of Jesus, God looks at you and he sees the righteousness of Christ and that is never, ever going to change. But Paul reminds us that the direction that God gives in his word is important. It's not, his grace is not an excuse to just give in to sin. And he also reminds us that sin is a serious, heavy influence in our lives. There is a battle between what we know is right that's revealed in God's word and the influence of sin that can leave us frustrated and even miserable. But we take courage, take courage from the truth that God uses times like we are in now to clear away more of that influence of sin. Paul's argument, his whole point of this passage is to say that the law is good. The law is not the problem. What is the problem is that sin remains a powerful influence to resist. 
And there's an implication for that. We need to join in God's work in widening the clearings of our life and replacing the corrupting influence with the, with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we do that by taking seriously God's word and by paying attention to the struggle in our lives. I grew up in the mountains of Oregon. And I say there are places, it's kind of hard to avoid places where you drive around and you see forest. And one of the things that you see a lot, in fact, there's a particular area I'm thinking of where you're probably a couple hundred feet above, you're looking down into forest, and you can see where forest fires have created clearings. And when you first see them, they are ugly, scorched. Honestly, they're painful to look at. But over time, something new, good, and beautiful grows in its place. Suffering, pain, chaos of things like COVID-19 work like forest fires in our lives. They're ugly. They're hard to watch. We don't want to be a part of them. But it can be an effective tool that God uses to enlarge the clearings in our lives. And so I am asking you this morning, do not miss the opportunity that you have in your life right now. God is widening the clearings. Join in what he is doing. Some practical ways that you can do that this week. Rewrite this passage in your own words. Identify one area where you are miserable in your struggle with sin, and that's the area to focus on. Ask the Holy Spirit for the strength, for the wisdom to obey Scripture in that area. And ask one person to be your support and encouragement as you seek to join in what the Holy Spirit is doing to widen the clearings in your life. And you know what? God is faithful to respond to that prayer. And so that is how we're going to end this service, by declaring that despite what we're experiencing, despite the chaos and confusion, God is faithful and he is at work right now 